first thing I want to do is say welcome to Quincy Compressor. Before you go to do any work on any piece of equipment, you want to make sure that all energy sources going to that piece of equipment are secured, that the energy sources are taken away, that there is no air pressure going to the machine, there is no electricity going to the machine. While you're working on it, you'll remain safe. Here we've got an electrical disconnect. Our electrical disconnect handle is in the off position. It is locked out. Nobody can come along, and that should be your lock on there. Nobody can come along behind you and turn it on when you're not looking. Put your lock on it, it's out. Put your key in your pocket. Nobody can turn it on without you knowing it. So, also the air source. Our air valve is turned off. That prevents any outside source of air pressure coming back into the machine while you're working on it. So those two things are very, very important. I want to see everybody go home at the end of the day safely and with all their appendages still attached. What we're going to be doing today is giving you a little brief rundown on how we do some minor PMs on our new QSI product. This is going to be the QSI 90 through 140. And it's also going to be the QGV as in Victor, the variable speed, 20s and 30 horsepower machines. First of all, we're just going to go do a simple remove the oil filter, remove the separator. Then we're going to replace the oil filter and replace the separator. You're going to need a strap wrench in order to accomplish that. Both the oil filter and the separator are both just spin-ons. So we're going to take those off. And then the separator, next. It's easier to get to the separator if you take the oil filter off first. When you're taking the separator off, you'll notice that when you go to lift it up off the stub, it's going to hit up there top. But all you got to do is just lean it slightly, and it'll come right on out of there without any problems at all. On your separator, you'll notice you've got a spot where you can put the hour meter reading and the date that it was installed. You can put that on there. That way, it's easy enough for anybody that comes up behind you afterwards to know just how old the separator is and how many hours are on it, or hours of use that's on it anyway. When you go to replace this, you'll notice there's an O-ring inside. That O-ring needs to be lubed up real well because it's got to go down and seal over there. It can be kind of a little difficult to get it over there. But also make sure you put a good nice film of oil on your sealing gasket. A little puddle of oil right there. Lube it up. Lube up your O-ring. Just be careful you don't get it cross-threaded. Simple instructions on there. Once you get it hand tight, just put your strap wrench on there, take it another half a turn. That should be sufficiently tight. And there's your hours, date of, date of installation. Now our new oil filter, get the right one. Do the same thing with it. There's no O-ring inside to throw it on the oil filter. You don't need to worry about that. Make sure you got a light film of oil across that sealing gasket. It's gonna make it seal a lot better, make it a lot easier to come back apart in the future. And there you have it. Separator oil filter have been changed. Just that simple.
Now that we're done with the oil filter and the separator element, we're going to move around to the other side of the machine. It's time to change the air filter element out. One thing you're going to notice with the air filter is the air filter assembly will turn on the inlet valve. That does not mean there's a problem, it's just the way the thing is designed. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to hold the inlet, I mean the inlet filter assembly with one hand while you take the cap off with the other hand. Again, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong, that's just the way it's designed. Once you get the cap off, pull the element out, get your replacement element, line it up, stays right there. Make sure you line up this element, I mean this portion of the cap with a hole in the element. Put everything back on, hold the assembly, and rotate the cap until it's locked. Now that we've gotten through the oil filter and the separator replacement as well as the air filter replacement, I'm going to point out something to you which I'm sure that you will all have noticed by now. There's a big red bracket right down here. Because you are going to be out servicing the machine that you're going to be working on, that machine should have already had a startup performed on it. That red bracket and the one on the opposite side, the same as it, should not be there. Those are to be removed at the time of startup. If the one that you are servicing does still have those red brackets, then somebody missed them when they did the startup. You need to go ahead and take them out. That prevents vibration transmission between the motor, the air in, back into the frame. You make a lot of noise and vibration. Just go ahead and take them out. If they are there, they should not be. Now that we have completed our standard service, we've changed the oil filter, we've changed the separator, we've changed the air filter. We want to go ahead and just do a visual inspection, run and look at your oil piping connections where they're attached to the manifold block here. There's one, and then there's another one in behind it. Just run your finger under there, see if you've got any oil dripping from there. If you do, make sure these connections are tight, that you've wiped them dry. If the, tight, if the connections are tight and you've wiped them dry, don't worry about it from now. Well, after you start it up and start doing your run-in check after the service, just see if the oil comes back. There's O-rings that seal these fittings together. If the oil does come back, you may have a cut O-ring or damaged O-ring, something you should have on your truck. Just go ahead and replace the O-ring. Simple, doesn't take but a few minutes. There's connections inside on the cooler as well. One at the top, one at the bottom. Just make sure you don't have oil there either. Should not be. If you do, just check it out. That's what you're there for, doing a PM. Over on the other side, we've got our motor bearing zerk fittings. This is where you're going to put some grease into the motor bearings. Just pop the little plastic cap off, the zerk fittings under there. Just attach your grease gun to it. Put in maybe two or three pumps of grease. That's all you're going to want. If you over grease it, you're going to blow the seals out in the bearings and you're going to hurt them. There's one here. And then on the back of the motor, there's another one on the rear bearing right there. Same thing. Pop the cap off, attach your grease gun, two, maybe three pumps. I think two is probably going to be sufficient. Just don't over grease it and don't pop the seals out of the bearings and cause damage to the bearings by over greasing and damaging the seals. On your discharge pipe coupling, you'll notice there's a gap on the clamps. These are new. Over a period of time, you may need to tighten them up periodically. If the clamps are touching, then of course the seals are as tight as they're going to get, and they probably need to be changed at that point in time. Run your finger across the bottom, see if you've got any oil. Shouldn't be, maybe a little damp, but it shouldn't be any heavy dripping oil there. If need be, you can tighten them up a little bit. One thing you're going to notice, these clamps and these bolts are loose. Leave them loose, do not tighten them. They are only there as a restraint, they're not there to hold anything together. They just prevent a lot of movement on that pipe. As the air in, loads up, unloads, this pipe is going to try to flex, and that's got to be there to allow a little bit of movement. Do not tighten those bolts up, leave them loose. Basically, that's about all. Here we have our separator scavenge sight glass. When you've got your machine running, you should be able to see a little bit of air oil flow through that sight glass. That means that the scavenge is working correctly. We have the check valve here, and the orifice is mounted up there on the separator scavenge itself. So those you may 
make sure they're clean. You do see the flow coming through the sight glass while the machine is running. You won't see any flow there while the machine is shut off. But only while it's running, running loaded. Once you get the machine started back up and running again, you're going to make sure you've got your oil level. There's a sticker on the tank that shows you what the proper oil level is. It doesn't have a line in there corresponding, but if it's lower than a half, then it's minimum. If it's completely full, then you got it over full. But if the oil level was correct when you first got there, it should be correct now. We didn't lose any oil when we changed the separator. We didn't lose any oil when we changed the oil filter. With them being mounted like they are, once the machine is shut off, the oil drains back out of both of them, back into the system. So if the oil level was correct when you first arrived, it should be correct now. But nevertheless, you should check it once you get the machine back up and running again. If need be, shut the machine back off, bleed all the pressure off again. You're going to have to follow your lockout tagout procedures. I don't want to see anybody get hurt. Once all the pressure is relieved, remove the cap, add the oil necessary, replace the cap, Put the machine back into the system, turn the power back on, start the machine back up, check your oil level again. This is our drive. So we've got a lot of cooling fins, we've got a lot of air that's going to be coming through there. We've got a fan up here at the top. That fan's going to be blowing, pulling air through the filter, bringing it through the package, through the drive, and blowing it out. So it's important to make sure that, that filter is clean. Pull the cover off. The filter element is in behind there. Replaceable very easily. But that thing needs to be inspected and kept clean and replaced as often as necessary. Don't know what kind of specific site, you know, problems you're going to run into. Of course, the dirtier, the dustier the area, the more frequently that filter is going to have to be cleaned or changed. And I prefer to have them changed than clean because once you clean them, you're still susceptible, susceptible to get trash and debris coming through them. But whatever you elect to do, that's up to you. But that is a very important filter that has to be maintained on a variable speed drive because without that being clean, we're not going to get cool air to cool that drive. It's going to run hot on you. It's going to overheat. The drive's going to shut down over temperature. So this is something that needs to be checked frequently depending upon your site specific requirements. If you've got a real good clean site you may not have to look at it but maybe you know quarterly whenever you come to do your quarterly service. If you've got a dirty and dusty environment and I've seen them like in a foundry you probably have to do it weekly if not more often. Once you've got it just put the face of it back on. Just line that little tab up right here at the bottom with that slot, and then just fold it forward and close it. Another thing we need to talk about before putting everything back online, once you've done with most of your service and everything, this is another thing that's very, very important if you want to do. Let's come back in and check the electrical connections inside the uh, starter box, or in this case, it's actual VFD drive connections. We're going to have this clearly marked incoming power down here. You want to check those connections, make sure that they are tight. You don't have any loose connections. And you might want to check your, your uh, little terminal connections too. While you're here, it can't hurt. Sometimes they'll work themselves loose. But the big thing is making sure that your incoming power, in this particular case, it's going to be attached right there where the big yellow sticker is at. It says connect incoming three-phase power supply here. Make sure those connections are tight. From there, we're going up into the terminal block. Make sure those connections are tight. This is called our line filter. Power goes into it, it's filtered, comes back out. Just pop the cover open, make sure that all those connections are tight. Just like anything else, when the machine is running, those connections will get hot. When the machine is shut off, those connections are going to cool back down. Over a period of time, from expansion, contraction, they will work themselves loose and they need to be checked periodically to make sure that they are maintained in a tight condition they get loose and are left loose, you're going to burn the wires off, you're going to damage the drive, you're going to cause yourself problems, you're going to cause your customer problems. Just make sure, very simple to check while you're on the job site, check your connections, make sure they're tight. Alright, now that our service is complete, we're ready to start the machine back up. Not yet. What we want to do first of all is come back up, go to the menu button. Once you get your menu button, go to the service. 
we're going to require password, enter our password. In this case, it's 100. Got it in. Then we come back to service again. Go to filter times. And this is where you're going to reset your air filter, your fluid filter, your separator, and the fluid if you've changed the fluid. So you just press the red button, reset, 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 and you're done. Hit return, return, return. Everything is restored, reset. All you have to do is press your start button to get the machine up and running again, then go back and perform your operational checks. In this particular segment, we're gonna go over a complete service of the units. We've already gone over the minor service. This is gonna be the complete service. First of all, we're gonna get the bucket, get our dual drain hose set up, get it all set up in our drain pan. Also, it's important to make sure you take an oil sample. We've got our sample bottle. Let's get the oil started draining. Here we go. As we're draining the oil, definitely want to catch the oil sample off this thing. lid back on. We've got an information label that we've got to get filled out. Top portion and the bottom portion. Bottom portion is the shipping. So it goes to the correct address. Then the top portion is the information label. Information about the machine, the hours on the machine, distributor, drop it back in the shipping container. By the time you put it in the shipping container now, make sure you've got your information label wrapped around the bottle into the shipping container, shipping container back. Again, make sure that when you put this in there, that you've got a fax number on there, and who is it from, and that's who's gonna receive the oil sample report. If you want your customer to get an oil sample report, put the customer's name on there, put their fax number on there. You wanna get a copy of it, put a slash, put your name on there, or your company name, and put your company fax number on there. Both, ad or both fax numbers will get the sample report sent back to them. But that is important. Remember, that's got to be done minimum every 2,000 operating hours. Remove the oil fill. You may need to get a funnel. It's kind of a small opening. But once you're done, However you want to do it, get your fresh oil, and you're going to fill it into that opening. Get the oil bucket up there, fill it up. What you want to do is fill it up till you get top of the sight glass. Again, the proper oil level is checked with the machine running and running loaded. Here's the instructions. Shows you the minimum level, shows you the maximum level. If you're not within that range, shut the machine back off, log out the air in the electrical source, make sure all the pressure is bled off of the reservoir, remove the cap, add some more oil until you get it to the correct oil level according to the level indications on the sticker. Right there with the machine, should be no mistake. Once that's all done, put your cap back on again, tighten it up, and it doesn't have to be extremely tight. There's an O-ring seal on it. Just want to make sure it's tight enough to compress the O-ring and tight enough that it doesn't work itself loose during operation. But you don't want to get it so tight that you have to use a cheater pipe to take it off. In this particular segment, we're going to be removing the inlet valve in preparations to put a repair kit in it or do an annual overhaul on the inlet valve. First of all, we're going to get the inlet filter off. Just remove that pipe clamp. And 
slides off. Get it up there out of your way. We've only got one air tube that we have to take loose. And that's back around here, just below the solenoid valve. put the air filter back on and we're just about done. That's it. Just as simple as that. In this particular segment, we're going to show you the disassemble and reassemble of the inlet valve or rebuilding the inlet valve. It's recommended to rebuild the inlet valve periodically. There are some rubber pistons and cups inside there that need to be lubricated, obviously, at least annually on the lubrication. And I believe it is uh, every two years you're recommended to install the rebuild kit. 
personally, I think I'd put the rebuild kit in there when I was disassembling it to put the lubrication in there, but that's just me. First of all, we're just going to pull this thing apart on the back of the inlet valve right there. We've got a snap ring. Got to get the snap ring out. There's a little spring underneath there, so careful that thing could pop out at you. It's not a very heavy spring, but nevertheless, there's a little spring there. There's the spring in that. Then inside there, it's the piston cup. This is the blowdown portion of the valve. That, you just got to get something in there, get around it, pop it up, so you can get it out. Yeah. Roll it up. If you get it rolled up, grab something, just reach in there, and pop it out. Done with that port. Put the back up. Snap ring pliers again. This one has a spring, but you don't have to worry about it just yet. Snap ring out. Cap off. The spring I'm talking about is underneath the piston. So we've got it captured right now. It's not going to jump out at us. Just something to hold the bottom of this rod and we got to take the net off Piston, spring, there's our rod, our loader, disc, and a small spring underneath it. And that's our inlet valve disassembled. Pull the rings off. Try to do it without sticking myself in the hand. Clean up everything. Nothing until I get that grease on my hands, everything gets slick. Now let's break out our parts. It comes with a tube of grease, so you don't have to worry about that. They think of everything. It's also got some instruction sheets in here too. Come in very handy if you've never done this before. Also, the orientation of the uh, packing rings that go on to the main piston cup, our main piston, and the spring orientation underneath it, the orientation of the parts inside. This is called the actual the blowdown part of the inlet valve. This inlet valve does both suction unloader as well as blowdown or relieving the pressure from the reservoir. So. This portion is actually the blowdown. This portion is actually for the unloader itself. The one thing I do want to show you, the solid sides are going to face each other, okay? So that one's going to go on the bottom, hollow side facing down, solid side facing up. This one's going to go on the top, the hollow side facing up, the solid side facing down. So they're going to be on there just like that. I've got the ring on there. This portion is laying in there nice and flat because I got that started first, but this one's still twisted. You can see it sticking out. So that's what I'm talking about. Just take your little flat blade screwdriver or something, not sharp. Just go and tuck it in.
Got everything all tucked in nicely. Run your fingers around it. You just feel the little edge of the piston ring sticking up there. Nothing really out of place now. The next one, bottom ring, is going to go hollow side facing down. The two flat sides are going to face the middle. Now, all tucked back in. <clears throat> Got that part put back together. Okay. Now, put it back together. I've already put the grease on this one. Got everything nice and well lubed up. Again, grease comes with the kit. Use it generously. Just put that in there. Roll it down in there. Then you just gotta force it to come back up flat. I've already got my O-ring in there. The O-ring, make sure what I did the first time was I flipped the O-ring into the top groove and that's when I couldn't get the cap back in because I had the O-ring in the doggone snap ring groove. It goes in the second groove down. Just make sure you put it in the second groove down and you'll be okay. Everything goes together much smoother. Then we got a spring. Make sure the spring stands up. So. Right, come on here. And spring up, take our cap. Yeah, this one here. We already got the O ring in there. Cap goes back on, centers up the spring, pops in past the O ring, snap ring. <clears throat> snap ring pliers are a must for this job. That portion is successfully back together. Now, we're going to put an unloader portion back together. Take the rod, small spring goes on, and our disc sits down on top of that. Slide that in through the bottom. Got it. O-ring is in the second groove down, not the top groove. Top groove is for the snap ring. Just give it a little bit of force, push it down in place. Copper ring, there and that. Rings in there, second groove, cap goes back on, snap ring. Ring is in. Inlet valve is once again back together, ready to be mounted on the compressor. After taking the fan assembly out, we'll show you how taking the uh, table that the fan assembly sits on can be easily removed. Once that's done, the motor is wide open for removal if you should have to move remove the motor for any reason.
Moved the panel so we got access to the cooler, I mean to the fan assembly. Had to remove the oil line that wraps around the side of the fan assembly. Also take out the, the vents at the top because we're going to slide this out and they hang down inside. So you won't be able to slide it out without taking that out of there. We've got a cutaway made into our panel here so we can just slide this thing out. There's a little panel that's made to clip back up inside there. So we had to take that out to open that little gap up so we can slide this cooler or fan assembly out through there. Now we just got to unbolt the fan assembly from the table that it sits on. It's got a series of four bolts at the bottom. It's got a couple of bolts on the side panels. We'll get those out of there and we'll just slide this whole thing straight out the side here. Okay. As you're taking your fan motor leads loose, there's six leads oriented from top to bottom. Be sure to write down the orientation from which you took them apart. This one I came across, I've got First one at the top was a U2, then it was a W2, then the V2. Then underneath that, the next three was a U1, a W1, and a V1. That way when you put them back in, you'll maintain your same fan motor rotation. Just Once you get everything loose, pull that out of the box. I took the whole strain relief and all. Now, if you needed to, for some reason, remove the drive motor, you would have taken the fan assembly out. All you gotta do and do is just unbolt the four legs of the table. Table lifts up, comes out. Motor's easily accessible. Yeah, in summary, first thing we did when we come up to the machine, of course we had to take off the panel so we can get access to the machine. Then once we got that done, had to take the oil pipe off that comes from here, ties back into the side of the oil cooler over here. Once we got that done, then take the bolts out of the fan assembly, where it's bolted down to the table, a couple of end panels on there, then come back around, remove your motor leads. Again, write down the orientation of your motor leads so you'll know where to put them back together. So you don't have to worry about fan motor rotation. Put everything back together, same way you took it apart. But regardless, once you got the motor leads loose, then of course, we slide the fan assembly straight out through the side here. If you do need to remove the cooler for any reason whatsoever, once you've got the fan assembly out, now the tubes that are on the inside are easy access. You can get to them with a wrench much easier than you can with that fan assembly still in place. And it doesn't take any time, hardly at all, to pull that fan assembly out. And there you have it.